Welcome to The Point. I'm John Fugelsang filling in today. We are taping this a week before Thanksgiving Day, and it's been quite a month leading up to the big holiday. Of course, Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast. We got to see the Obama-Chris Christie collaboration, which I give a 10 to, and not just because those two men resemble that number when standing side by side. Uh, also, Election Day might have happened. You might have noticed that. Governor Romney lost the campaign, but handily won uh, in all of the states voting against our own interest belt. Um, the Koch brothers woke up the day after Election Day to discover the entire Republican Party had redistributed their wealth. And the new James Bond film opened on the same exact day America's top spy had to resign for having sex with one person. Welcome to a very special Thanksgiving edition of The Point. Now, the first documented Thanksgiving was actually not the Pilgrims. It was the Spaniards here in America in the 15th century. In 1619, English settlers in Berkeley 100 ordained a day of Thanksgiving to God. And in 1621, on the famous Plymouth Plantation, uh, what began the modern Thanksgiving celebrations. Of course, in 1863, Abraham Lincoln designated the last Thursday of every November to be a day of national Thanksgiving after a feverish op-ed campaign by Sarah Joseph Josepha Hale, the same woman who wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb. That's right, that song is directly related to the tryptophan you're eating this week. Um, but the mythology behind Thanksgiving is just that, mythology. We're going to talk about the mythology behind it, as well as talk about the very real specter of Black Friday, which is the counterbalance holiday for Thanksgiving, when the 1% tells the 99% to go shopping and save the economy they wrecked. And finally, how to deal with those very difficult right-wing family members around the Thanksgiving table, or the very difficult left-wing family members. We'll be having some very important tips on that, because as you know, every Thanksgiving, 90% of families are most thankful for time away from their families. So I'm thrilled for today's very special panel for a special <laughs> holiday show. Joining me today, we have James Spady, a professor of U.S. history at Soka University in Aliso Viejo, California, which was founded on the principles of pacifism, human rights, and the creative coexistence of nature and humanity. Why do you hate freedom? Uh, James's <laughs> research is focused on the importance of colonialism and colonization to American cultural development. I hope you'll be very strict on keeping us right about our history in this episode. Absolutely thrilled about it. Uh, Kelly Carlin is a regular on The Point and uh, also the host of The Kelly Carlin Show on Sirius XM and Waking from the American Dream, the podcast, and the stage show, A Carlin Home Companion, in which she shares stories, rare video footage, and memorabilia from a life spent with her famous father, the iconic hero to us all, legendary comedian, Richard Pryor. <laughs> and uh, Alta Gracia Perez is the priest at Holy Faith Episcopal Church in Inglewood, California. She famously appears in the excellent film Walmart, The High Cost of Low Price, and has been a strong voice of protest demanding that Walmart better serve the communities where its stores are located. Did the greeters greet you or just run away when you walk in? I don't walk in, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have three great points for the show this week. I'm thrilled to have three brilliant people here to join me because I'll be balancing out your, uh, your genius. Uh, we're going to be having one point from the story of stuff creator Annie Leonard, uh, who's going to talk about whether the best way to give thanks is trampling your countrymen to get a new Blu-ray player. Uh, we're also going to talk about whether it's possible to express disagreements over politics with relatives around the Thanksgiving table without the conversation resorting to gunfire. But first... We're going to hear from University of Louisville history professor John Cumbler about the true story of Thanksgiving and the mythologizing and whitewashing of American history. It's our national pastime. Take a look. Hi, I'm John Cumbler. I'm a professor of history at the University of Louisville. My most recent book is From Abolition to Rights for All, Study of Reform Movements in the 19th Century. And I want to talk about today about the mythologizing of American history. And since Thanksgiving is coming up, I thought I'd mythologize that. The first Thanksgiving dinner, which actually did occur, was really a celebration of the harvest and cooperation between Native Americans and uh, Europeans. The, what we call the pilgrims um, would have died over the winter of their first year if it had not been for Native Americans helping them out, teaching them how to, to grow the classic American crops, uh, giving them food. Of course, the, the Europeans also stole from the food stocks of, of the Native Americans in the first, their first few weeks on shore. The irony, of course, is that after that, um, over the next 50 years, the Europeans had a tendency to forget their dependence on Native Americans. And rather than um, a sort of 
think of the Native Americans as their saviors. They came to see Native Americans as a, uh, a hindrance to European control over the land mass and the resources, which led to a policy of what today we call ethnic cleansing, by which Europeans just basically tried to move all of the Native Americans out of the region as much as possible. Thanksgiving pretty much disappeared as an event, as a memory, uh, until the 19th century when it was invented as a holiday. Going back to that first meal, which, by the way, was not called Thanksgiving, um, and that's when they invented the term Thanksgiving and the idea of this celebratory meal. But, of course, it was a celebration of a moment of harmony, and in that celebration, they forgot the extermination of the Native Americans. And also, ironically, as Native Americans were being exterminated on the Great Plains, we were embracing this, this holiday uh, of, of Thanksgiving and, and joy and celebration of cooperation between Native Americans uh, and Europeans. So it seems to me that here we are celebrating Thanksgiving, it's important to celebrate that moment of cooperation. That was a high point in, in, in sort of European appreciation of their vulnerability and their willingness to work with other people and to cooperate with other people. Uh, but we shouldn't forget uh, that following that first uh, Thanksgiving, uh, 50 years later, was a policy of extermination that continued on through the rest of most of our history. Uh, and that's also part of the story of Native American and European interaction. Thank you, Professor Cumbler. And uh, Professor Spady, I want, I want to start this off with you, because when we think about Thanksgiving, we think about the mythology all the time. The fact that all the paintings we know, the, the, the Wampanoag Indians are dressed like Plains Indians, even though it's November. <laughs> and the pilgrims are all dressed like Puritans, even though they were actually less uptight. It's not hard to be less uptight than a Puritan. Uh, so really, the only thing we know for sure about the original Thanksgiving is that when the Wampanoag Indians brought them food and saved their lives, they began the ugly tradition of giving socialism to illegal immigrants. Uh, and we celebrate that to this day. So my question, sir, is generally speaking, how accurate are the stories that we tell ourselves about the past of our history? Wow, yeah, that really depends on um, who's telling the stories, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, I think the traditional, obviously the traditional Thanksgiving story is, is very inaccurate in a variety of ways. Um, many of them you just cited. Um, I think, in general, people tell themselves the stories that they want to hear. And this one, the Thanksgiving story, you know, it's a, it's a nationalist celebration, right? It's born in the Civil War, in mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln's proclamation for it. And it, its purpose was largely to give people a sense of unity. So it's, it's a glorifying story that, um, in making myth, tends to erase certain realities. Uh, one of them uh, being, of course, the mass dispossession of indigenous people from from their homelands in, in, uh, in southern New England. So is this like an example of the sort of thing where we whitewash history just so we can sleep better at night? I mean, we all grew up with the pictures of the happy Indians and sharing their maize with the happy, well-scrubbed, well-shaven colonists. I mean, is this, is this just so white people can live with themselves? It's like a living example of how no good deed goes unpunished, mm -hmm. where you save people's lives and then you proceed to take their lands and their lives and as, a, as a gift in return. And the challenge is that if you teach your children better history, then they go to school and they tell the truth and they get in trouble. I've gotten calls from teachers about my children disrupting the classroom because they've shared a more realistic story. And for any people who are not in the mainstream of history, then you become the malcontent because you're sharing your people's real story in the face of the myth. And then it's kind of like, why are you the party pooper? You know, we're, we're all having a great time. I'm like, well, we're not all having a great time. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think consciousness is a good uh, you know, part of this, is that I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a story that unifies and lifts us all up and mm -hmm. inspires us, but then we need to bring reality in and be able to hold that at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the more difficult things that Americans have you know, in doing is holding both negative and positive thoughts at the same time and trying to understand that reality actually is made up of both of those things. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's a conscious, I mean, I think you shouldn't be teaching kindergartners about genocide. You know, I'd like to have right. little, the little turkey They need that time for sex ed, I understand. Exactly. Yes. But I think, you know, as, as children get you know, older, I think education needs to fill them in. And of course, that yeah. then comes to who's educating our children. You know, even, even very young children can understand conflict. Right. Uh, the, the major thing that's erased in these tellings of the Thanksgiving story is the sense of conflict, right? 
Um, even a very small child can understand a persistent conflict with somebody. Sure, and it, it can be taught around that quite easily. Yeah. Well, mythologizing our history is really a, pure, a, a truly American tradition. I mean, you, and, and our cinema is the greatest example in John Ford's Man Who Shot Liberty Valance when the guy says at the end, when the legend becomes truth, print the legend. Up yeah. through Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven, which has a whole character of a biographer who follows Gene Hackman around, you know, making up stories to tell what the real history is. Our whole national uh, identity is based on myths, from Betsy Ross made the American American flag to Rosa Parks wasn't an activist, just a tired lady on a bus that day. <laughs> Paul Revere yeah. was riding around saying the British are coming. That comes from a poem. Yeah. Reaganomics helped the middle class. We live on these on these treasured myths of, uh, of society. My favorite being George Washington's I Cannot Tell a Lie with the cherry tree because that story is a lie. <laughs> my, my question to, to, to y'all is this. Uh, do we need this? Does this help us unify as a people? Does it help the American tribe come together? And is there an upside to the fact that you have to dig deeper to get the real history? Well, I think people in general uh, tell stories about their origins and their beginnings. And I think uh, the mythologizing part of it is our collective unconscious need to, to have heroes, to have something, uh, have a mythology that, that is important to our psyches. But mythology in this sense we're talking about is BS it's a lie it's it's not the bigger understanding of what myth means like Joseph Campbell would talk mm -hmm. about and and so and you know I always find it interesting too that you know we it's 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 propaganda. If we really understood that it's, in a sense, propaganda, then maybe we would hold it as such and not treat it as a truth in some way. And as the Reverend so ably points out, the truth tellers get called malcontents. Right, exactly. And the, and the or whiners. Or we don't do history in our country very well at all. Mm -hmm. And it's not because it's hard or you can't find a positive line, right? These Native Americans, the first Americans, the original Americans, shared a child likes sharing, or a child knows they're supposed to share. Right. Children don't like to share, so they're going to get the conflict right away. Yeah. Um, this is not <laughs> something that's beyond their experience. And unfortunately, what happens then is that then when movements today seek to speak truth to power, they have no basis. So we're going to all eat this Thanksgiving right. from the bounty of our land and not knowing the truth the farm workers are the most exploited people in Ca some of the most exploited people in California mm -hmm. and we're all going to eat this bounty and not think about the fact that they'll barely have enough to feed their families this season. And, and, and I like that we can all go ahead. There's please, a missed Professor. opportunity too because um, there's the stories themselves the mythologies as we're calling them you know are are meant to create this sort of false kind of unity. But they also then, they're in suppressing the actual history of conflict, they're preventing people from seeing other kinds of heroes, right? Yes. Yes. Um, heroes that, that come through the, the very necessary conflict and struggle over real power inequalities in the United States history. Um, I mean, th there are obvious ones, there's you know, Martin Luther King Jr., there's, there are obvious figures, but there are also just scores of much less celebrated figures of course. Um, who are partly responsible for you know, rewriting how we understand the history. But it is important to understand that you know, there, there are different versions of the United States' history. Um, they're taught in schools, certainly. They're uh, shared in the media uh, that um, represent themselves. They are in, uh, the descendants of that struggle itself, right? Mm -hmm. The story we tell ourselves is in some ways the ideological um, cultural form of the older struggle that we've inherited. Well, as, as much as I enjoy being with a bunch of smart people who agree on things, I do want to play devil's advocate <laughs> a bit here, okay. because uh, when you actually look at history, what would happen if we taught Howard Zinn to all our children? What would happen if people's history of the United States was the original textbook we got? I mean, w you know, George Washington beat his slaves if they ever fought with each other. Uh, Thomas Jefferson father sold his own children into slavery and was outed in the press by his opponents mm -hmm. for doing it. I mean, this wasn't something we just discovered. They were talking about Thomas Jefferson and the slave kids. The Puritans were absolute dicks. Uh, you know, is there something to be gained yeah. by prettying up our history for the sake of national unity? It's called avoiding personal responsibility, which is something the right talks about all the time. Mm -hmm. And if we were really to be responsible about our history, we would have to mourn it we would have to grieve it, we would have to come to terms with our own personal shadows, our own personal urges to want to oppress other people, to take away uh, resources from other people, but we would get yes. our souls back. Yeah. And we would be a real democracy, because part of the challenge yeah. is that all the myth-making that happens raises up these mostly white guys mm -hmm. as the heroes of democracy. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, it was those slaves that rebelled, it was those women that protested, they're the real heroes. And suddenly, oh my gosh, 
they look like me, they have access like me, maybe I can participate in democracy and make a right. difference because I'm not an old white guy with wooden teeth. And because I can't you're, do that's this. a myth, by the way, you didn't have wooden teeth. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, exactly. You were lied <laughs> and, to. And, 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 because myth. Also, and because also there's an actual history of that kind of exactly. struggle. There's a right. long, long history of people struggling. I, I like what you said about um, that the, there would be a need to do a lot of mourning and, uh, you know, the, the broader history, being able to engage with that broader history. Uh, would actually necessitate a different contemporary politics. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it's part of the reason why it's so controversial to mm. do so. Right. Could, you make the argument, to... could, could you make the argument that Japan and Germany were made to have a reckoning with mm. ugly parts of their past? Not that they're all flowers now, there's still plenty of right-wing douchebags in Germany. But I'm <laughs> saying that those are a couple of examples of nations in the past hundred years that have had to confront uh, their own crimes against humanity. And I, I mean, those are the most like big examples, but I think other people are just more realistic about the humanness of their history. Mm -hmm. And that's why, for example, having sex with, you know, breaking your marriage vows is not national news for a whole week while people are having all kinds of other struggles going on. In fairness on. to Jefferson, he was a widower at the time. It was completely <laughs> legitimate slave rape, I'll have you know. So, oh, okay. yeah. Well, here also, you know, the other thing too is that this is, I think, just part of human nature. We all want to make our lives and our histories uh, you know, uh, pretend that it's better. We, you know, some of us idealize our parents and then, you know, part of growing up and becoming a mature adult is actually taking them off the pedestal and seeing, oh, they're human, they made mistakes, they did the best they could, uh, you know. And so I think a, a just naturally we're wired to kind of like shuffle it all under so that we can move forward because, you know, forward is about survival in some uh, ways. There's always a community of people who are served by that kind of forcing under of these, of these other Absolutely, right. of course. It, yes. I would, I would say one of the biggest mythologies that we have though, um, um, is maybe it, partly in our conversation already. I think one of the biggest mythologies that Americans have, certainly in the Thanksgiving story too, is the notion that the United States is somehow exceptional. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And, well, we and that's that not myth. just in the sense of better, but exceptional in the sense of completely different. If we talk about, if, we, if you look at other, mm -hmm. other nations and the way in which they treat their history, there are famous you know, examples of being more forthright in dealing with, say, the Holocaust in Germany or something, yes. than we are perhaps with slavery. But there are other issues where, where they're not terribly good at but acknowledging the historical difficulties. It's true. I, mean, I, yeah. think the, I think the Confederate flag is a perfect <laughs> example of that. You know, you could argue that a lot more folks died under American slavery than died in the Holocaust. That's not to equate the two experiences. Don't write hateful comments to me. I'm just saying one could argue that, and yet the Confederate flag is still largely acceptable, whereas Germans don't go around flying the swastika. That means they like David Hasselhoff music and still are more tasteful than us. <laughs> and that's very. But you mentioned something that uh, you mentioned about parents and parents history and since I think Kelly Carlin you're the one person here with a famous parent I I'd like to ask you about that because uh, a lot of mythology I'm sure has arisen about your dad that you're aware of and yes. every day of your life you meet people who idolize your 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 wonderful famous dad and you have to I guess always walk the line do I burst this person's bubble by telling the human side of my dad or do I let them live and do I let do I print the legend yeah as and John it, Ford you said. know and as my father was a truth teller and, um, and so I like to speak the truth also. Now, my truth about the family sometimes made my dad a little uncomfortable because he wasn't a person who, who shared his personal details with people, but I don't say anything out of school or talk about anything he never talked about. But part of me gets a little pleasure in bursting the bubble because like the mythologizing we're talking about, like this idealization we do, it's dangerous ultimately. And um, and I think my father wasn't, I mean, all the things people worship my father for is lovely, except it's ironic when people worship my father and call him the Messiah, when my father was clearly an, you know, an agnostic atheist and um, wanted people to think for themselves. So, uh, you know, I have a lot of fun with that. And I was just talking to a comedian this morning, same thing, loved my dad, worshiped him, and I started telling some stories. and. He said, at the end, I'm glad you told me because it makes him more real and more human to me. And I think that's what we're saying about American history, yeah. too. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just all be human with each other? Mm -hmm. And that we have to grow up. Yes. I mean, mythology has its place, and symbols have their place, and heroes and sheroes have their place. But we kind of have to grow up and take responsibility for ourselves. Yeah, we got some stuff to do. Which we don't like. <laughs> we don't like. <laughs> well, really quick, Professor, then, is there any way to have objective history? Does that exist? Uh, no, is the short answer. <laughs> it doesn't Good exist. Uh, there, there are different kinds of, obviously there's, there's more and less objective in a sense if you can really have an absolute like that that can be measured uh, in a spectrum. But, um, you know, there, there is history that, you know, you can show is, is better documented, is, is more reasonably argued. Uh, but you don't, you don't have such a thing as an absolute history, nor do you have a situation where you'll be absolutely free of 
sort of mythos of the American national past. As long as we're organizing our history around essentially a fiction, mm -hmm. the notion of a nation, a community of people that all share a certain set of values and ideals and a common history, we're going to be mythologizing our past to some degree. Well, from the conventional wisdom that the Declaration of Independence was signed on July 4th to the conventional wisdom that Al Gore really said he invented the internet, he didn't. I think <laughs> the solution for me is that every year we have to have a national campaign to have all of our treasured uh, lies about history compete and call it Myth America. We'll be right back. <laughs> we want to know your comments. Let us know below. And after the break, it's Black Friday here on The Point. Welcome back to the Thanksgiving special here on The Point, where we are pro-thanks and pro-giving. And our next segment is going to be Annie Leonard of The Story of Stuff, who will remind us what Thanksgiving is and isn't supposed to be about. Hi, I'm Annie Leonard with The Story of Stuff Project, where we're working on solutions to the take-make-waste economy that's trashing the environment, undermining our communities, and threatening our health. You know, when you ask people what they're most thankful for, three things generally rise to the top of the list. Good friends and family, good health, and the wonders of nature. Thanksgiving should be a time when we especially celebrate these things. But these days, too many Americans are leaving their Thanksgiving dinner table early to go join mobs of shoppers. We made this little video to inspire you. This Thanksgiving, choose family over frenzy. Check it out. If you like it, watch our other videos and join our community at Story of Stuff. I love what they do at thestoryofstuff.org, and I've always agreed with them until Hurricane Sandy hit New York and I just lost half my stuff. I'm still in grieving. Uh, but I'm glad that we have you here, uh, Alta Garcia, as the, as the, uh, the priest, uh, I want to get your title correctly, of uh, Holy Faith Episcopal Church, because I, I find that Black Friday has to be examined through a spiritual prism. When you consider that Black Friday is when Christians tend to begin, uh, Christians kill each other to buy material possessions to celebrate the birth of a guy who renounced material possessions. Right. And, and so, uh, yeah, <laughs> just a bit. So I think, it, it, how do we go from, how, how did we as a, as a society go from celebrating thanks to presumably a God, that's what it was intended for, for appreciating what we have to trying to slaughter our fellow Christians to buy the new Degrade Me Elmo doll? It's funny because I think there's a fine line between abundance and overdoing, and we do both of those at Thanksgiving. So we mm. eat too much, mm -hmm. and then we run out and shop too much. And the more you have, it's as if the more you get, the more prizes you win, you know, like when you get to heaven. And so it's a terrible challenge because technically, at least in my tradition, the season before Christmas is supposed to be a season of fasting and prayer in right. preparation for the coming of the Messiah. And it is so countercultural. I mean, the parties start at Halloween and never stop. There's no mm -hmm. time of reflection. There's no time of thought about giving. And so it sounds quaint, but people keep saying, oh, well, you know, Jesus is the reason for the season. It's kind of, who's Jesus? We want Santa Claus. You know, yeah. it's like, it's nothing to Jesus, do with it. Jesus, he's the guy that works in the loading dock at Walmart. Get right. out of my hey, way. Jesus, hey, Jesus, exactly. <laughs> so, so but, but, you know, how does it feel to you guys to see this keep capitalism in Christmas Friday? I mean, it's one thing to look at these folks and just be shocked at their appalling behavior. But how did this happen? This didn't happen a uh, hundred years ago in America, we weren't this craven. Were Madison we? Avenue. These are our neighbors. These are these are the people that we that we know who are they're trying to kill each other. It's a blood sport. If you sport. look back at the uh, if you look back at the Pilgrims and Puritans that we started the segment with, thinking about Thanksgiving, uh, the the previous segment, um, they didn't celebrate Christmas. Uh, Christmas is not strictly speaking 
uh, to them it wasn't a biblical holiday, and mm -hmm. so they, they, since it wasn't specifically you know uh, recommended to them in, in the Bible, they didn't they didn't want to celebrate it. They looked at it as what they would have called popery, a kind of negative way to describe Catholicism. You know, they wanted a spiritual, a thoroughly spiritual and biblical celebration. What we have here is um, obviously thoroughly commercialized, and that's really a 19th century process that produced this holiday and it's just it's simply got more I think more department more stores actually huh? invented it they invented I mean not, not necessarily Christmas trees but the idea of people bringing Christmas trees into their homes and decorating them and putting gifts under them were I believe created new mythology by department stores in the early 19 in 19th century and um, were fed to the people is something essential and then you know then your neighbor has it and then mm -hmm. they do it and they do it and yeah. and watching that video of the people running i mean all i could think of it's like it's like this false sense of 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 deprivation or scarcity of some kind like if i don't get that thing something's going to be empty inside of me and that's yeah. so it's it's completely manufactured. I mean, six months ago, these people weren't thinking about that thing. I mean, maybe their kid was or something. But in some I, sense, I wonder if it's if it's a, a, a related to the general feeling of decline that people have in their in their general material status, the shrinking middle class, and the way in which people they, they pursue bargains in part because it allows you then to have certain trappings of a middle class existence at a cheaper cost. Right. You know. Uh, I think so there, there's I mean, desperation. There's behind there's it. that. But the yeah. I mean. I don't know if you know anybody that does this. I do. <laughs> and the blood sport piece is real. That's there wild. is a sense of like, this is entertainment. Yeah. And so whereas in the past, That's you me. would, you know, you'd go to the Coliseum, watch the lions right. eat, you know, <laughs> the Christians. This is part of entertainment. Now it's like, Walmart. can I get there first? And can I get the things? And they're sharing who got what at what price. And it's a competition. So either after Thanksgiving, you, you fall asleep in front of the football TV yeah, show, right. mm -hmm. or you run out there and, and you shot and participate and in the blood fun. sport. And you're right, Alta, but, as, but while, yeah. while this blood sport is new on, on the Friday after Thanksgiving, which I call Thingsgiving, uh, <laughs> the, the actual tradition of having it be a big shopping day deliberately with the intent of boosting the national economy, yes. as you point out, Professor, is not new. This goes back when? To, to the, the 20s, the 30s, or, or earlier? Uh, I'm not entirely sure exactly when it originated. I think you'd find that um, the gift practice goes quite far back and it's just been gradually increasingly commercialized probably especially in the 19th century as the United States industrialized. So, so let me play let me greater. let me play yeah. cold-hearted capitalist for yeah. a second here. Uh, while it's easy for us to poo-poo this horrible behavior and talk about the commercialization of a holiday devoted to a guy who didn't own stuff, uh, can we not agree that the commercialization and that this this uh, movement to buy things as gifts for our loved ones while it may be, you know, personally uh, distasteful does benefit all of us if it benefits the national economy. Yeah, I mean, I, it does. We reap the benefits of it even while we criticize and, and, and it. A, and a lot of uh, companies make their nut this time of year. I mean, that's when they make all their money is, is this time of year. So it's important. And yes, if we buy things, there are people then making things and there are jobs. And of course, we don't make a lot of these things here anymore. That's part of the problem. Uh, so I, I think it's, you know, I think it's part of capitalism, but there's there's unhealthy capitalism and there's healthy capitalism and there's unhealthy consumerism and healthy consumerism. And once again, it's about mindfulness, consciousness. Yes. It's about, am mm. I just emptily filling a void or am I really considering something? I mean, one of my greatest things that I love about the holiday is finding the perfect gift for someone mm. and watching them, the, the look on their face when you open it and you know it's the thing, not that they want it, but you know that it fits them perfectly. Uh -huh. Such joy in giving that, mm. you know, which is just so completely opposite of that thing. Yeah, and there are, are, and there are so I mean, absolutely. movements to do the, you know, the small shopping. I think they've picked a day as well for you to go to small shops yeah, small and business. buy yes, things yes. You know, that are made, yeah. yes. even though it's yeah. being like sponsored by a big corporate yeah. company. But I mean, I think there are ways that people are seeking to be more mindful, to support local businesses, to support people who make things themselves. Um, artists who are always looking to, you know, yeah. and the question is whether it real. I mean, it does fuel the economy, mm -hmm. but my challenge with that always is, but does it ever come back to us? Yes. Um, yeah. Are we really being employed? Are we getting enough of the money right. back well, into yeah, our and community? That's, that's right. a, yeah, and I mean, the, are you're people talking, being lifted up? Really, you're talking by this two economy. very different issues. Yeah. On the yeah. one hand, I do agree with you, Kelly. I do think that the, you know, both Thanksgiving Day and Black Friday are both indicative of our national psyche. I think in many ways it is a spiritual. <laughs> 
spiritual path, how do you balance mindfulness with consume, consume, consume? Mm -hmm. And I think that in that level, these these two days being next to each other are hilariously <laughs> ironic. ironic. But you do know that they're <laughs> no longer next to each other, right? Do you they're realize that on well, which, well, Yes, that's which now leads to what you were yeah. talking about, yeah. Alta, which is now we're seeing folks who thought who work at these retail stores who thought they could have Thanksgiving dinner with their yeah. families right. are yeah, having to be at work yeah. at 8 p.m. on Thanksgiving because Black Friday like begins on Thursday. It's like we can't wait till 6 a.m. the next day. Right. Really? I think it points to some degree to the way in which the economy and the cult, the structure of the economy and the culture are, are sort of joined here, right? The, the, the economy is constantly pressing people. Economically, the corporations constantly press people for more time to sell things, right? Mm -hmm. So the employees at a Target or a Walmart are going to be called upon, are going to be forced, really. They're not being given a choice. Yeah. To, no, they're not. To work well, uh, on Thursday, Thanksgiving. Um, and it's it's part of this structure of a consumer economy that's obviously thoroughly globalized at this point, but that presses on any value that doesn't fit the imperative to sell more. Yep. Exactly. And, and, that then, goes and this war on Christmas is a good idea. war on Christmas. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. in the sense that, you know, it's like, let's really, let's make it a time for gathering and a time to, to uh, some silence in our lives and some prayer or, you know, whatever your beliefs are. And, and, and I, I, you know, I, I, I always laugh at the war on Christmas because I think, well, you know, that's, that's a whole other thing. But this could be like a real, you know, we could really reclaiming get behind this. Christmas. Both the, the, the left Christmas. and the right well, could get yeah. behind I mean, this. One of the big movements, sure. uh, and there are many movements going on this year, many for workers' rights and many of people who work at stores like Target or Walmart who are trying to change these policies. But Buy Nothing Day is something that's, you know, gotten a lot of press in recent yeah. years. Oh, it's a way of rejecting the consumerism of the culture. It's also tied into the movement of making your own gifts, uh, which I think is positive, but I'd also like to see more of a push to try to get Americans to understand the benefits of buying locally so your money doesn't go to a chain store and leave the community. Now, yep. if you go to a Walmart, yes, your money will go to the employees who will then spend it, hopefully locally, but generally, your money's not gonna stay in your community with a giant chain store the way That's it would right. stay if it went somewhere local. That, if I felt like, I mean, you know, folks were asking me about, we just had this conversation yesterday at my church because the Walmart workers are having to come in at four o'clock in the afternoon on Thanksgiving. Well, these are the you know these are low wage workers. They don't have a choice. They can't yeah. say, "Oh, I will or won't work this day," and they're not getting time and a half or double time for working nope. a holiday either. So, I mean, if they got some benefit, then yeah. it would work because yeah. those folks are going to shop in the same neighborhood. Yeah. When we were organizing supermarket workers, they, we had to organize them around not yeah. shopping at Walmart mm -hmm. because low wage workers will try to find the cheapest prices, but they're not even benefiting directly. So, yeah. it really behooves the question, can we be thoughtful, can we be mindful, can we shop for, can we shop and not have shopping be who we are? Yeah, and, and take wonder. it, and take <laughs> the conversation back. I mean, yeah. this is the thing, it's like, it creeps up earlier and earlier. I was saying I went to another big box, you know, store, mm -hmm. October 15th, and they were already selling fake Christmas trees. Mm -hmm. October 15th. I wanted to like run and tackle this thing. And, but it's like, we, how do we, you know, how do we form the conversation that we want with these corporations? And if buying fake Christmas trees on October 15th helps America inch out of a recession, can we scorn it? There's I the wish, question. I don't think there's the rub. Us. Yeah, so I say buy. You know, <laughs> she, I, I she's say not if I were convinced, she's not I'd go. It. I don't even like shopping, and I'd yeah. go shopping if I were convinced. I'm not convinced. Yeah, it's, it, it might it might inch you out of a recession, right? But it's inching this particular economy with its particular structure out of its recession. Right. right? This particular so structure. What, what we produce then is. Uh, 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 we're advancing down the development that we're already on. And I think of the, the workers at a place like Walmart or, or, or Target who are going to be working obviously on Thanksgiving evening and, and the f others who are going to come in shopping, who of course bear a certain level of responsibility for what's happening, being yeah, a consumer. Absolutely. They're going to purchase. But, but there is then a class divide on Thanksgiving evening between those that must work and those that will consume. Right? Mm -hmm. And those um, who can afford to wait later because they don't need the sales in order to buy their kid the one thing that right. they've wanted right. all year. So I think, I think what we're saying is that buying gifts for Christmas, while it may go against the teachings of Christ, can be very good for your local economy. But remember, <laughs> you're allowed to buy local. You're encouraged to buy American if you can. And remember, you can always have a small business Saturday Saturday instead of Black Friday. This is the point. We want your comments, and we'll be right back with how to handle your horrible right or left wing relative at the Thanksgiving table right after this. Welcome back to a very special Thanksgiving episode of The Point. I'm John Fugelsang, joined by our incredible panel, and you know, 
I just want a Thanksgiving like we all had growing up. All the family gathered together, pretending to get along. It was beautiful. Um, for the final point, we're going to go to the traditional Thanksgiving table, laid out with the requisite portions of turkey, stuffing, pumpkin pie, and cranberry sauce that no one wants. And uh, above all, um, the national tendency to have families whose members squabble or fight violently uh, about politics and religion and various social issues, arguments that have been in the family longer than the children who are now at the children's table. Uh, today we're going to talk about what to do at your family's Thanksgiving dinner when that horrible right-wing relative or that horrible left-wing relative won't stop dominating and make other people feel bad because they don't agree with yeah. them. Uh, you know, Kelly, I want to go to you on this one because I've always been of the opinion that family, alcohol, and tryptophan are a dangerous combination. <laughs> So what's Thanksgiving, what, what was Thanksgiving like in the Carlin family when you were growing up? Because I guess no one in your family ever had any firmly held political or social beliefs, right? <laughs> well, you know, we were, had a small family, so that was, that was one thing. And, and most of us did agree politically. But, you know, it was heady times. It was, you know, the 1970s. And usually the arguments were more about who's bogarting the blow. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So we didn't, I, I never was at one of those weird Thanksgivings where, you know, that side of the table had that opinion and that side of that, well, you know, and we always had uh, cranberry from the can. Oh, very nice. Yes. Well, since we have a member of the, of the clergy here, I guess I would have to ask you, you know, for everyone who has been in those horrible family gatherings where, where the right-wing homophobic war-loving uncle makes everyone <laughs> feel bad, uh, I mean, what is acceptable to do? What is the most graceful way to handle the horrible person at your table because you know we, we all have those horrible family members and you don't have to like them but you have to love them I think it's deciding where you know what's at stake so if it's right. something that's just so horrible that it cannot be tolerated then you might want to say you know maybe you're taking that a little too far but other than that listening smiling saying yes that's an interesting point mm -hmm. and then walking away is a really good strategy as the person in my family with whom the rest of the family doesn't agree mm -hmm. I mean they're clear that I'm not going to heaven which is always a very interesting experience um, when you're part of a broader wow. conservative Christian family mm -hmm. um, it is interesting to see that this is the same thing that happens at weddings yeah. at funerals it's yeah. not because it's a holiday it's because the family had to get together yeah. and all that family stuff that's been oozing and bubbling all year long comes up mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah. I, you know, I know you're a historian, yeah. and so for me, I, I think that even if you don't like sports, uh, I love sports because I think sports is the reason we haven't had a second civil war in this country. <laughs> how how true. men, America's true religion. Men, no, well, no, that's denial, Rick. That's denial. <laughs> but how, how, how men who in the wild would be at each other's throats politically can be brothers united in an arena, I, I think is actually the most endearing thing about sports in this society. I find normally when I'm around the ta table with uh, disagreeable relatives, a few safe things to fall back on. Uh, sports, always good to get the liberals and conservatives agreeing. Uh, James Bond films, always good, <laughs> timely. Yes. And of course this year, David Petraeus. The adultery <laughs> part, not the Benghazi part. Okay. The scandal part. Well, well, sure. But here's the other thing too, is I don't think people going home to their families aren't sometimes worried about the politics. They're just worried about the fact that when they go home, they're going to be treated like a 12 year old again. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, that's the right. reality is that people go home and your family constellates into some sort of dynamic where everyone is the teenage age they used to be yes. and so no one and is an adult we're all accomplices and yes exactly mm -hmm. and we're all playing the game and, and and when I was a therapist I used to prep my clients and you know practicing things to say to their mother or father when yeah. they treated them like a 14 year old and learning to be an adult in the situation and you do you have to own it for yourself too and and be willing to stand a new ground which can be uncomfortable in the moment, but actually can progress your family forward a little bit too. Yeah, and I think people know when to extract themselves from arguments. I mean, if you at least practice this, you know, you don't want to get into a the kind of toe to toe battle with somebody. Although some families which, thrive on that. Some yes, do, they and, do. And for some, but it's I still good natured. Some you can have that. I mean, yeah, I, exactly. You know, look at, it's look. often good natured in those contexts. They're willing and ready to have debates. They're not going to take it terribly personally. Um, but a, a lot of times, you know, it's actually the, the, whatever the debate is is actually a proxy for some much older yes. argument that never did get settled. Ever. Um, <laughs> from Christmas <laughs> years past which, or, which or something us, like that. Which brings us back to the concept of grace at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. And much more important than a, pr a benediction before the meal is how are you going to have patience and love for people who are really wanting to make you smack them in the head with a mallet. I, I, I do think that uh, <laughs> one rather interesting element of all of this is um, when it, where do you draw the line? 
Like, like, is it ever okay? You mentioned difficult relatives. My father was a Franciscan brother, uh, came from a very, very big uh, conservative Christian family and married into a very big conservative Christian family. So I had, I had Southern conservative Christians and Brooklyn conservative Christians. And <laughs> my, my dad reached a point where like if certain uh, racial words were said, he would get up and leave. Mm. Wouldn't fight, mm -hmm. get up and leave. And I do think that in the era of Twitter, we can learn a lesson from this. Mm. I, I see people Lock like- Lock troll? <laughs> well, you, not block the troll, but here's the thing. I see people, celebrities I admire, comedians, journalists, who get into these flame wars with, with you know, right-wing haters all the time. And I'm like, dude, there's girls watching. Why are you doing this? But one thing I've learned is I only try to engage with my haters on Twitter if I can do it with humor yeah. or with something right. instructive because people are watching. My advice for when you're dealing with the ideologue, and again, mm. they could be a left-winger too, uh, you're never going to convert anyone. You're never going to win anyone over to your side, but you can win over the bystanders. Mm -hmm. And let that be right. your goal. Don't try to convert anyone to your side. Handle them in a way with love and patience and humor and hopefully facts that those sitting around watching will agree with you and make the other one look like the sad loser they are. Yeah. Yeah. Also just listen for what the real message is yes. because people yeah. are not that personally invested in things that are going on far away. So if you can listen and go, you know, I've always thought that you were smart about X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. That'll go a lot yeah. farther. Or it sounds like you really care kidding. about that. Or yeah. you re that really means a lot to you. And you don't yeah. necessarily have to say very much, right? I mean, sometimes people really just want to be listened to. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and, they, and they want to be listened to by you because you never listened before. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I have a theory about humanity yeah. which has never been proven wrong, which is happy people aren't dicks. And um, <laughs> pardon me for that, Alta, but this is this is. But it's very, very true, actually, because if you're in a place of being at peace with yourself, you're not going to want to have any rancor. You're not going to want to cause any fights or altercations. So when someone is being rude, when someone is looking to pick fights, when someone's looking to provoke you at that table, that's because of something you're the therapist inside themselves that they're not happy with. And when you can speak to that pain, humanity transcends politics. And isn't politics the stupidest thing to divide us? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's why at my Thanksgiving table. I always ask everyone to bring uh, uh, three things that they're grateful for that year. And it's really interesting to see how uncomfortable it makes people when they have to talk about this because you have to take the mask off and be willing to be real and intimate with people. You know, I have about 20 people normally. And it, it's, people get nervous, public speaking and things, but I think it's really important that we all take our masks off with each other and say, wow, I'm really grateful my mom, she, she made it through breast cancer or you know, whatever it is, you know. Especially this year because the leading cause of Thanksgiving family political fights this year may for the first time ever be democratic gloat. Um, <laughs> so just remember out there, folks, it's not officially a family fight until someone yells, we're not fighting, we're discussing. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I want to give our, our final thoughts. And uh, uh, James, I want to start with you. I want to ask, uh, how can people follow you and what are you thankful for? Uh, well, I, I don't have Twitter, uh, Good but um, anybody that's interested in some of the uh, work that I've written, the research I've done, could go over to uh, Soka University of America's website. It's uh, www.soka.edu. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have S-O-K-A. Uh, S-O-K-A, thank mm -hmm. you, yeah. Um, and I have, uh, I have uh, links to uh, several articles I've published, and uh, I'm working on a couple books. Um, and what am I thankful for? Yes, sir. Um, that is actually really hard. The mask has to come <laughs> off. Um, yeah, I was, I was thinking uh, about how the mask is about to be ripped off and uh, trying to... I, I am actually really grateful for the outcome of the election. Uh, I am grateful for that. Um, I don't uh, want to do any gloating about it. Indeed. Um, I, I actually don't think there's a lot of reason to gloat about it. I agree. Um, but uh, secondly, I think I'm, I'm really uh, grateful for a lot of the students that I work with. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I love about what I do is uh, my ability to interact with, with young people. Uh, who are uh, very serious about trying to do something useful in the world. Brilliant. Thank you. Alta Gracia? Let's see. I think I want to plug and be thankful for the same things. Um, I'm very thankful for my family, my little nuclear family of six plus one persons at my house, um, and the diversity of uh, the diversity that is there. I'm very grateful to my partner and my children, but um, also very grateful for my congregation, to which I invite everyone who is looking to get away from all this craziness and focus on spiritual things and become a better person with people who have all kinds of opinions and are glad to share them. Um, Holy Faith Church in Inglewood, you can find us on holyfaithla.org and we'll have some wonderful Christmas programming and it'd be great to come and we have a diverse congregation. 
everybody under the spectrum is there. Color, I'm, I'm race, gonna come, creed. I'm going to come visit your church next time I'm in L.A. Yeah, you should. You'll have a good time. All kinds of great salsa music. It'll be awesome. Sounds fun. <laughs> Nice. I'm always happy to meet a sane clergy member. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, see, this is mythologizing, ah, but it's okay. Yes. Uh, I have uh, my one-person show that I'm touring, a, Car a Carlin Home Companion, which people can find out about at <coughs> kellycarlin.com, of course. And, uh, and I, I mean, I have a lot of personal things I'm thankful for, but one of the things I'm thankful for about the election is that it just felt like parts of the country and that the conversation about human rights and the drug wars and mass incarceration, like just with the legalizing of marijuana and the gay marriage, and some of these things moved forward a little bit. And I yeah. felt we've been working for 50 years on these things, and it's starting to just track a little bit. So I'm really thankful that people are waking up and mm -hmm. seeing what's reasonable and practical for the world. Uh, well, I'm thankful to have hosted The Point yet again for uh, this terrific audience that the Young Turks has amassed and for a panel like this. And most of all, I'm thankful for the fact that when the final votes were tallied from Florida, Mitt Romney did finish with 47% of the vote. <laughs> Take that, atheist. There is a God, and he's laughing his holy ass off right now. Uh, I'm John Fugel saying thanking all of you, wishing all of you, whatever your spiritual bent, a very, very safe and healthy Thanksgiving. And remember, if you're going home, Keep in one thing in mind, not all your family are relatives, and not all your relatives are family. We'll see you next time.